evening everybody and welcome back to Queenie of London for the second part of my walk through Millbank. Millbank is over the road over there and you remember that is Chemical Industries building over there and I'm now walking through Victoria Tower Gardens so called because it offers some spectacular views of the Victoria Tower. If you haven't seen part one of this tour, I will link it. I think it's in the top right hand corner on your screens now. So give that a watch to see how I got here. Now there is some amazing memorials in this park, as I mentioned towards the end of my last video, all with freedom at their heart. Now these gardens opened in 1881 after the retailer WH Smith, so the news agent, stationary guy, he donated a large sum uh, to lay out the land so that it could be used as a public recreational space. The son of W.H. Smith, also called William Henry, he was in charge of the company at this time and he was also the MP for Westminster. They are named, as I said before, after the Victoria Tower. You can get a pretty damn incredible view of it right down the middle there. I'll give you a little bit of information on the gleaming Victoria Tower in the evening sun a little bit nearer for now this memorial here is it fenced off all the way round this is the Buxton Memorial had a little look but I can't quite squeeze myself through the tiny 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 gap between those railings and the embankment to get in so they must be doing some uh, maintenance on this memorial but I will tell you about it as I do a little walk around it. Uh, it was named after the MP and philanthropist Sir Thomas Fowl Buxton and erected by his son Charles. Uh, this memorial stands as a tribute to his father's work in campaigning against slavery in Parliament. He succeeded William Wilberforce as leader of the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, which was the organised group fighting for the abolition of the slave trade in the British colonies during the 1800s. I'm going to poke you through there actually, will that be alright? Get my arms stuck, that'll be fun. Uh, we can thus view Buxton as having an instrumental role in achieving the Abolition Acts of the 28th of August 1833. Us Brits did that. Buxton was also the brother-in-law, interestingly, to Elizabeth Fry, and he also used his position in power to stimulate prison reforms. There's a monument to Buxton in Westminster Abbey, over there behind, But this one is intended to mark the emancipation of slaves which he fought for. This actually originally stood in Parliament Square from 1865 until 1940. It was moved here to protect it from enemy bombs during the Blitz and it was reinstalled here in 1957 and I think it is such a perfect position for this memorial. And isn't that a picture? Now, I'm really hoping that the other thing that I wanted to show you isn't at the point that I can't get to by these uh, railings. But 
I want to go because I haven't actually been in these gardens before, so I'm exploring today with you. Oh, that's pretty. Look at that view. See, I like this in, uh, this entrance here because look at these buildings; they're beautiful. Normally, you'd have this stunning view. It's beautiful. Right in the centre of the gardens. Lovely, serene, green space. So I'm looking for a green heritage plaque. Keep your eyes peeled. Westminster Bridge, St Thomas's, oh, rusty, over there you can make out Lambeth Palace, concealed by the trees, Museum. I think they might have put scaffolding around that too. Now the green heritage plaque that I was actually looking for was for one Sir Thomas Pearson Frank and as I can't actually find it, I don't know if it's been removed for maintenance but it should be here but I will tell you about it in this spot because it's pretty fitting. This plaque was only unveiled in 2014 to commemorate one of the great untold stories of the Blitz. At the time, the actions of this man, Sir Thomas Pearson Frank, were kept secret uh, so as not to affect the public morale. But the actions of him were instrumental in saving London from drowning. 
Thomas Pearson Frank was the incredible and visionary chief engineer of the London County Council who set up a rapid response unit to repair damage to the embankments caused by the German bombs. This story was unknown until a team of researchers for the Thames at War Riverside project, uh, Riverpedia, I think it's called, uh, part of UCL, uncovered uh, the secrets. Now, Pearson Frank had arrived in London from Yorkshire in 1930 and was well aware of the capabilities of the Thames and what would happen as a consequence of burst banks because of the flood, as I spoke about in my previous part of 1928, which so affected this particular part along the river. Now, Pearson Frank had commissioned a survey as soon as he started in his new role to assess the vulnerability of each particular area. He then set up four major depots staffed with emergency responders and filled with sandbags, tarpaulin and timbers. These uh, depots, stores, they were known as the Thames Flood Prevention Emergency Repairs Unit. The units responded to around 70 major incidents in relative secret so as not to alarm the public and to keep the vulnerability of the Thames walls secret to the enemy. So without that man, arguably, there would have been a heck of a lot more loss of life during the Blitz than there already was. And he's rather an unknown hero, and I think he deserves a bit more than a flack, personally. Over there through the trees, where that boat's coming up, you can see County Hall not to be confused with City Hall, where Red Khan resides. And as you can see, there's another memorial coming up over there. And I'll take you to that now. This one coming up, again placed centrally here, is known as the Burgers of Calais. And of the memorials in these gardens, this one has been here the longest, uh, unveiled in July 1915. What we have, what you can see, is the work of French sculpture Augustus Rodin, the chap who did the thinker. And it's a memorial to the Burgers of Calais. This is one of 11 casts of the original sculpture, which stands in Calais. And until I res started researching this video, I had never ever heard this particular story from the Hundred Years' War. Now, under Edward III, Calais had been surrounded by English soldiers for a year. You'll notice up on there, if I just go and get the other ones in, that there are six figures atop this sculpture. And these are the six men, the important burghers, who bravely stepped forward in an act of ultimate self-sacrifice to die for their countrymen. Edward III said he would spare the city's population if six of the city's most important men surrendered themselves. He viciously demanded that these six men walk out of the city walls wearing nooses around their necks and carrying the keys to the city and to its castle. This sculpture is intended to document the moment the six men gathered at the city gates. At the last minute, Edward's wife, Queen Philippa, interjected and begged her husband to spare the men and, insist, and instead demanded the surrender of the town and thus the people of Calais were permitted to leave.
such a beautiful evening in London. I think it's about quarter past seven now. Gorgeous. Look at my flag. Now, one final memorial to show you in these gardens, and it's coming up in this circular space here, I believe, if I'm correct. Yes, I am. Here she is. Now, I don't need to say too much about this great, great lady, Emmeline Pankhurst, the founder of the Women's Social and Political Union who battled to get us ladies the right to vote through deeds, not words. And she died just two months before the government's representation of the people, the Equal Franchise Act, was passed, which gave women aged 21 and over the same voting rights as the guys, regardless of their property ownership. Am I zoomed in? Sorry. There you go. So inside this pedestal here, such a wonderfully expressive memorial as well, I should say. She's in one of her familiar poses. And apparently she went to the theatre to study actors and how they presented themselves. But uh, inside the pedestal, as I was saying, uh, there's a metal box which contains the letters of Mrs Pankhurst and the obituary which was published in the Times on her death. This statue was unveiled in 1930 by the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, who was famously, vehemently opposed to the voting rights of women, didn't really want women to be enfranchised and have a political voice. And interestingly, Officers of the Metropolitan Police, who were musically gifted, asked to play at the unveiling of this statue, and many of them had been involved in the arresting of suffragettes at their many demonstrations. Um, there's also a statue, the newest one actually, in Parliament Square to Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who was the leader of the National Union of Women's Suffrage so uh, Societies, sorry, uh, the main suffragist organisation, that one, which distanced uh, themselves from the more militant tactics and direct action of the WSPU of Pankhurst. Whereas the statue of Garrett Fawcett holds a banner proclaiming courage calls for courage everywhere this statue to Pankhurst has her poised in that familiar pose and it's one of her preferred gestures apparently and is intended to honour her great talent for public oration. There is another Pankhurst statue in her birth city of Manchester entitled Rise Up which has her in a much more impassioned pose giving a speech standing on a chair. This statue was originally placed up near uh, Lambeth Bridge at the entrance to the gardens, but it was relocated here in 1958. So when it was relocated here, it was at that time that they added this semicircular stone part of the statue with these two bronze medallions at either end. Uh, the medallion over here depicts the prison brooch of the WSPU. And on the right hand side is a profile bust of Emmeline's daughter, fellow WSPU leader Christabel Pankhurst who died earlier in the year these additions were made. And then here... So 
before I exit the park, I'll take you over to some more gardens with a story to tell. I'm just going to take another photo. So these gardens we find ourselves in here are known as Abingdon Street Gardens or more commonly College Green. And look at that for a view. Now that part of the palace is the Victoria Tower. It was renamed after Queen Victoria to celebrate her Diamond Jubilee in 1897 but when it was originally completed in 1860 it was known as the King's Tower. After the fire of October 1834 which famously destroyed much of the original medieval palace of Westminster, including all the archival records of the House of Commons, a competition was held <laughs> uh, for someone to come along and design its replacement. Uh, the winning entry came from Charles Barry and added to significantly by Augustus Pugin and it was actually Queen Victoria who laid the first stone of the building work in 1843. When it was completed, it was the tallest square tower in the world and it is ever so slightly taller than the existing Elizabeth Tower on the other side. This building was purpose-built for the fireproof, this time learning their lesson, storage for books and documents. And 12 floors of the towers, 14 it has, are still dedicated to the Parliamentary Archives What a Place to Work. I guess that's where all the hands are. Amazing. Now that great arched entrance there with the scaffolding around it at the min is so used when the Queen last time it was Prince Charles that's the entrance the monarch uses 
for the state opening of Parliament. Now you'll notice that our beautiful Union flag is fluttering in the gentle breeze there. Union flags must fly from government buildings at all times which I think is a beautiful thing but when the monarch is inside the palace the royal standard is flown from the iron flagstaff at the very top. Now the steps, you might not be able to see them today because of this scaffolding, the steps that lead under that arch, the sovereign's entrance, lead up to what's known as the Norman porch, that's the royal staircase, and the Norman porch is so called because it was originally intended to house statues of the Norman kings. Now, due to the tower's prominent position and its part in royal ceremony, Charles Barry designed it particularly rich in carving and sculpture in the interior and the underside of the entrance arch. You'll still find beneath that arch statues to the patron saints of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, a life-size statue of Queen Victoria, and two allegorical figures of justice and mercy. Uh, as Queen Victoria was the reigning monarch, during the reconstruction of the palace, the monogram BR appears throughout the palace, as do numerous other royal emblems such as the Tudor Rose and the Portcullis. Now, if you're in Abingdon Street Gardens, be sure to stop by and take a look at this. Now you'll notice, when I was talking about the Great Fire, and the records that were destroyed i didn't mention for the records for the house of lords this is because they were kept safe from the fire because they survived because they were stored in here now this is known as the jewel tower but it wasn't always used to store records it was however intended to store something a lot more precious as its name suggests it was the place where royal treasure was kept in the private palace of Edward III. So this little building is part of the old medieval palace that survived the fire and dates from incredibly the 1360s. The southernmost end of the Palace of Westminster would have been where the monarch dwelt way back in the day and it was known as the Privy Palace and set away from the more functional areas of the courts and the exchequer around Westminster Hall in that direction. Now the jewel, the jewel tower stands in what would have been royal gardens surrounded by a moat and I believe that there is a reconstruction of that to show where it would have been I'm going to nip down there in a minute so we can look at it closer. Oh, I can't nip down there because it's closed off because it's British summer time and everything shuts early. <laughs> it will have to do from up here today. Now, at the time, this tower and its surrounding moat and garden encroached upon land that belonged to Westminster Abbey. And there's a brilliant little story, a uh, written article on the English Heritage website, which describes some divine retribution as they see it. Uh, the Benedictine monks of the Abbey of Westminster felt that this retribution was served on the keeper of the king's privy palace for having taken over their land. I will leave this linked below so you can give it a little perusal at your leisure if you wish. It's rather entertaining. 
Now during the time of the Tudors, its use seems to have downgraded some for more domestic purposes. It stored household items and rather lovely, this is quite cute, it stored the dolls of Princesses Mary and Elizabeth, the daughters of Henry VIII. Now around 1600, the tower started to be used to store records for the House of Lords, as previously mentioned. And this may have changed when the Lords was abolished during the English Civil War. But when the monarchy was restored in 1660, the tower continued to be used in this way. There are many repairs and alterations carried out in 1718, including the addition of the brick parapets and the Portland stone windows. It's around all of the windows. The roof had to be entirely replaced after it was hit by incendiary bombs in May 1941. And when carrying out repairs, it was decided to present the building as a monument of its own past. You can, of course, go inside this lovely little gem and view its presentation of its own history and various uses since the 14th century. And you are able to climb to the top. You don't need to book online, but it's advice that you do and there's a discount if you do that. Now, as I've said, these gardens are formerly known as Abingdon Street Gardens but we more commonly know them as College Green. You'll recognise it as it's used all the time by news channels to interview MPs and political figures right in the heart of the action. It's often known on the inside as the honeypot because backbench MPs like to run over here to get their word in for interview. They know that they'll be picked up here for their opinion. It's also used by protesters, who I hope will continue to make as much noise as possible, and they should be able to make as much disruptive noise as possible within earshot of the people who work for us. Um, during major political events, Brexit being a rather noteworthy example, there was so much broadcast news from here that College Green became a media village with tents and marquees set up by all major broadcasters. Now we're going to leave Abingdon Street Gardens and I'm going to give you a little bit more information about certain parts of the palace and a lovely little church around the corner. Now here, facing the House of Lords, 
we have a statue to King George V. He was king from 1910 to 1936 and father of Edward VIII. He was the one who abdicated the throne in favour of marrying his love, the divorcee American Wallace Simpson. He was also the father to Albert Frederick Arthur George, aka George VI, the father of our current monarch. Elizabeth II. Now I'm going to just double back very quickly because it's the easiest place to cross and show you Old Palace Yard. Horseback is Richard Coeur de Leon, Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, English King, 1189, sorry, and 1199. He faces towards the entrance to the House of Lords, and he's been stood here with his horse since 1867. He was originally made of clay for the Great Exhibition and stood at the Crystal Palace. Now this bit where he stands is known as Old Palace Yard. An Old Palace Yard was a courtyard of the medieval palace of Westminster during the time of Edward the Confessor. Old Palace Yard connected the palace with the Westminster Abbey. It was a quiet and secluded spot where people were just used to have a break from city life. Old Palace Yard was at the centre of the gunpowder plot. In 1605, Guy Fawkes and his confederates rented one of the houses which ran in a row across the centre of this yard and first began to tunnel through to the House of Lords until they found it much easier just to hire a cellar under the houses themselves. Uh, they were captured and pronounced guilty and they were hanged from a scaffold erected in this very yard. to it was the little bit of a grisly past. Sir Walter Raleigh in 1618 was beheaded in Old Palace Yard. His widow took his head away wrapped in his cloak and kept it for over 20 years in a glass case until she herself died. This stunning smaller part here is Westminster Hall.
And this is the oldest part of the whole parliamentary estate and the only part that remains very nearly in its original form. This was built in 1097. Under William II, who was the son of William the Conqueror. Monarchs after William all left their mark on the building. Richard II, for example, had the stone walls refaced inside with 15 life-size statues placed in niches. It has had many functions over its long, long lifespan. It was used mainly for judicial purposes until the 19th century. In 1215, Magna Carta itself decreed that courts would sit regularly in this very hall. It has been the site of state trials, most famously that of Charles I, William Wallace, Thomas More and Guy Fawkes. It has also been used for ceremonial purposes. Coronation banquets were traditionally held here from the 12th to the 13th centuries and it's also where monarchs have lain in state. However, Winston Churchill and the Queen Mother have also had the honour of lying in state here because they meant so much to the nation. I'm going to be very, very naughty. Now, in the late 17th century, a door to the south end of the hall became the main approach to the commons. The hall thus became, in effect, a sort of outer lobby of the commons where petitioners, footmen, people seeking political gossip, they'd all gather in the hall. Samuel Pepys's diary indicates that when Parliament was sitting, the hall was the prime place for obtaining political information. Um, the hall became a less public place by the 1820s, even though the public was still usually freely admitted. There's a lovely story um, in that, in, that says in 1833, Charles Dickens having for the first time sold one of his stories in print, walked around Westminster Hall for half an hour with his eyes dimmed with joy. Now, this is grisly again, I'm afraid. Upon the restoration of the monarchy, Charles II, the son of the executed and beheaded king, had Oliver Cromwell's body posthumously hanged at Tyburn, then bought his head to stick on a spike on the roof of the hall. And speaking of Cromwell, here he is in statue form with his head on. Here he is. Lion at his feet, sword in hand. Now, there was some vocal opposition at the time to having a statue of this man who led an army to depose the monarchy and who ultimately cost that monarch not just his throne but his head. Uh, the matter was debated several times in the House of Commons before there was a parliamentary vote on the matter. As recently as 2004, MPs have petitioned against the statue, proposing it be moved somewhere else. However, this positioning seems to be the best in my view because he stands here in an eternal showdown with Charles I who is mounted above the doorway to St Margaret's Church and I'm swinging over there. I'll take you over there in a moment. Now, from a little bit of wider reading, it seems that the bust over there above that arched door was put up 60 years after this Cromwell one. So the little myth that Cromwell was deliberately designed with a hanging head to avoid the glare of King Charles should really be dispelled. But I like <laughs> seeing 
him look out that way as if he's avoiding the gaze of Charles's head. Also significant that that's just a bust. So I'm now going to walk over to St Margaret's over there. Now St Margaret's is known as the Politician's Church and it's formerly known as St Margaret's of Antioch. Nobody really knows much about this Antioch but it's stuck and it seems to be quite a popular story from that time, popular devotion. This has been the parish church to the House of Commons since 1641, but the history of the site goes back much further than that. Actually, while I'm here, I'm going to divert you to this. This squiggly W is the sign of the Duke of Westminster. And these cross C's that look a lot like the logo to Chanel, or maybe because it is related to Chanel. Now in part one, I spoke a bit about the Grosvenor family, the Dukes of Westminster. They are the Grosvenor's eldest sons. Um, so check out part one if you'd like to know a bit more about those. And this crossed C logo, draws attention to the fact that for 10 years from 1924, Gabrielle Coco Chanel had a romantic love affair with the then married Duke of Westminster, Hugh Grosvenor, who she famously refused to marry, stating that there have been many duchesses of Westminster, but there is only one Coco Chanel. Now again, urban legend dictates that Hugh Grosvenor put up all these bollards with all these um, stamps over, all over his lands in London as a gesture of his undying love for Chanel. However, very sadly, and a, such a less romantic <laughs> explanation for the CCs, say that it's just a signature of county council. And I think that's boring and it does look like something that should be on a bag so i'm gonna stick with the chanel love affair thank you so <laughs> over there we've got st margaret's church we're back on track let's go one final shot of westminster hall from here love the little turrets and look at look at big ben elizabeth tower from there so this goes back to the latter half of the 11th century and it was built interestingly because the monks at the newly founded Westminster Abbey Benedictine order of monks were being disturbed while they were practicing their Opus Dei, their God's work and they didn't like it very much that the residents of Westminster were encroaching upon their private devotions, so they built this church. See, they're everywhere. Charles above the door. And there's Oliver Cromwell over there. So, by the 1400s, the original building was somewhat dilapidated and work began to improve it in 1482. There's been loads of repairs and a few additions since then, obviously, but it does remain much like it was at this time. Thousands of people are buried under the grass which make up its land. 
but there are no graves for these people since the graveyards were removed in the 1880s. Now the walls within this church, if you're about and visiting the abbey, I would recommend giving this stunner a visit too. The walls are a total knockout. They're completely lined with different kinds of adornment from plaques to statues and extended epitaphs. You'll also find uh, multiple portcullises, which are the symbol to the House of Commons. And there is a special wooden pew with a portcullis stamped at the end, which is especially reserved for the Speaker of the House. Now, Samuel Pepys, the diarist, we all know, was a married man who liked the ladies. And not only did he like to admire the ladies while sitting at service in this church, he also liked to meet his lady friends in here for a little rendezvous. So he conducted his intermarital affairs inside this church. Now, I'm not sure if I can go because I just went to check that gate and it's closed. This is a problem. Even though it's lovely and bright, it's a lovely day, everything's shut. <laughs> um, there's a beautiful stained glass window around the back which has a brilliant story. Can I see it from here? If I go around that, is it on the other side? No, it's not one of those, is it? It must be, the, yeah, I think it's right, the one at the back. Let's see if we can go around that way. Winging it now. So this stained glass window, it's got a, it's a really good story attached to it. Um, it was created in Holland in 1526 to celebrate, it was commissioned to celebrate the marriage of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. But stained glass takes a long time to complete and by the time it was finished, Catherine was long gone. <laughs> He'd moved on to Anne Boleyn. Um, the marriage was annulled break with Rome, restoration, reformation, sorry, not restoration, that would be bad. Um, <laughs> so the window could no longer go in its intended spot in Westminster Abbey, so we had to put it here. Now Walter Raleigh, who you'll remember I said was executed over there, was later on buried with honours in the churchyard here. And Charles II, after he had exhumed, hung, and put the head of Charles, uh, head of Cromwell, sorry, on a spike atop the hall over there, he also exhumed the bodies of the men who had signed the death warrant for his father, and he had them burnt and buried in a pit in this very churchyard. And there's a memorial erected by the Cromwell Society in remembrance of these men. John Milton of Paradise Lost fame is buried here and uh, Chaucer was a parishioner. And on the 12th of September 1908, Winston Churchill, whose favorite pub is just over there and whose statue is just over there, he married his wife Clementine in here. And most recently, you'll recognise this church as the place where the remembrance service for David Amos, the MP who was murdered, it was held here, his remembrance service. I think that concludes my fact field tour and for the rest of the video 
I'll keep a little quiet and let you enjoy some views, evening summer views of the Houses of Parliament, including the gorgeous shining Elizabeth Tower over there. I might pop on to Westminster Bridge so you can have some views from there too. I really sincerely hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave me a thumbs up as it helps other people discover the video. And make sure you check out part one if you haven't already to see how I got here from Millbank and the many sights that you can enjoy if you take such a wander. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Don't forget to subscribe if you fancy for more videos of London by a Londoner. Until next time, have a nice evening, see you soon. Lots of love, Queenie. Una catedral. You're right over there, boss.
ಹೋಗ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ